on this edition of Lifeguard. Kid hit the water, other friend hit right on top of him. Any slight movement could cause paralysis. Or do you need everybody away from the cliff? And. And I just look and I see a head way out there in the red current. I thought the guy was going under. The waves are probably 10 to 12 feet out there. And he was swimming straight through them. Plus. Is he allergic to these yeah. things? This child had rashes and trouble breathing. He's going to start to go into shock. And later. Dispatch to all units. We have a four-year-old missing child. You last saw him in the water, right? Yeah. This is Sunset Cliffs in San Diego, California, where the ocean dramatically collides with steep cliff faces, creating awe-inspiring beauty. Thanks to a weather phenomenon called the Pacific High, temperatures remain mild here almost year-round. The Pacific High, which is a permanent feature over the Pacific Ocean, affects us in a great way all up and down the North American West Coast. If it's a large, strong Pacific High, that will end up deflecting in a storm formation or Pacific Lows, and it's going to push it inland over the continental U.S. rather than allowing it to flood down all the way into what is usually sunny Southern California. During the hot summer months, when air temperatures peak, visitors like to cool off in the ocean. Some hike down to the rocky beaches. Others take a more dangerous approach. One of the most popular areas for cliff jumping is Clairborne's Cove. And people of all ages come here to jump from the arch. Cliff heights range from five to 30 feet. But here, jumping from over five feet is both dangerous and illegal. With shifting tides and hidden rocks, a carefree jump can go wrong in a hurry. A kid jumped off, and then he was jumping with his friend. His friend went right after him. Kid hit the water, other friend hit right on top of him. And then when they came up, the other kid was like out of it. His mouth was bleeding, so they carried him up on the cliff. I used my friend's phone to call the ambulance. Dispatch to one Sam for a report of a medical aid. It's gonna be a 20-year-old male collided with another. Uh, indicate traumatic injuries due to a fall and a loss of sensation on the leg. One Sam to dispatch. Oh, we'll go ahead and get in service. We'll take jet one, and I'm going to need 11 Sam to come to Ocean Beach to cover. We deployed jet one. Myself as an operator and Michael Smoker as a crew person responded code three. Lifeguard Lonnie Stevens is patrolling the ocean on Rescue West when he hears the call. I was on a surf rescue boat. We were less than two minutes away. Rescue West, copy. Do we know if the victim is still in the water? On a ledge, there was a male who was laying on the rocks. He had been extricated from the water already. I determined that he's conscious and breathing. And then I try to get a quick background as to what happened and what his primary injuries were. Jet One arrives to back up Stevens. Saw that guard Stevens was taking sea spine precautions, so jumped in the water to assist with that. Copy this to Rescue West on dispatch to 16-year-old patient. It's down just above the jumping spot on a shelf here at Osprey. He's oriented times three, neck and back pain, and he's having difficulty breathing. This patient could have significant neck or back injury, and any slight movement could possibly cause further damage to their spinal cord. Neck hurt. Maybe you feel like you can feel that. And what you pull up, you can down. So until we have the patient completely packaged in the C collar and mobilized to the backboard, we take great caution not to move the patient any more than, than we have to. Lifeguard Lieutenant Greg Buchanan arrives on scene and takes over as incident commander. We came with a rescue boat, a jet ski, and then paramedics and uh, fire. Paramedics quickly take over care, evaluating the injured team. Lifeguards have set up safety ropes to prevent rescuers from falling. It was a very difficult area to access trying to extract them around slippery rocks and up basically a 10-foot ledge could be very um, difficult. From there, we have to think about, OK, well, how are we going to extricate? And so the option that was decided was to call a helicopter and do an air evacuation via the helicopter, which is a bit tricky. 
Helicopter pilot Eric Connor and medic Chris Sobe are at Montgomery Field when they receive the call. We saw it was lifeguard in need of uh, assistance down at Sunset Cliffs. We just lift off and we go. And en route, we gather up as much information as we can. The fire rescue helicopter surveys the scene and consults with Buchanan before deciding on an approach from the south. We're going to need them to do some crowd control. We're going to need everybody away from the cliff. Paramedic Chris Sove will be descending to the rocks. So once we started to make our approach and I left the uh, aft cabin of the helicopter, I don't have voice communication with anybody in the helicopter any longer. So everything is done off of hand signals. So I'm looking for uh, obstacles in my way of the approach as we fly in. And the first signal I'm going to give is when I'm 10 feet off of perceived obstacle or the ground. And in this case, it was the first cliff edge with lifeguards and their rope systems before we got to the, the other side where the victim was. So uh, I gave Captain O'Malley the 10 foot off signal when I was there. And as soon as we clear them, I give them the down signal and uh, we go down uh, from there to the water's edge. Once I touched down on the ground and uh, secured myself to the safety, I had to do a quick survey, uh, just to investigate for any other injuries. Okay, 16 year old male, about 150 pounds. We'll need about five minutes for packaging. The 16 year old boy is still having difficulty breathing. And while his neck and back are now immobilized, there is still life threatening danger. The victim must be moved from his position and secured inside a Bauman bag. Transferring the patient quickly and safely is imperative. We take extra measures to make sure the patient is stabilized, his neck, his spine, everything is in line to prevent any further injury, making sure we keep the patient secure uh, all the way up to the helicopter. The victim is stabilized on a backboard, but the extent of his injuries is unknown. He needs higher level care quickly. Lifting the patient to the helicopter requires a high hover, an essential but risky maneuver. One hundred feet in the air, Chris Sobe continues to calm the nervous patient. Any sudden movement now could cause the two men to spin uncontrollably. With a, somebody with a spinal injury, we try and make that transition as smooth as possible and prevent any jarring of the patient. Our helicopters have the hoist mounted on the outside of the aircraft, which creates a little bit of a tricky situation once we pull on some straps to bring the patient into the aircraft. Go doors close once we get him back in so we can increase our airspeed. Lifeguard dispatch copies, patient extricated, transporting UCSD via Copter 1. I think that was a good role for the helicopter. And because of the training we've done with them, we know what to expect. And then we know what they need from us. And they know what, what, what we're going to be asking them to do. So it's, it's good teamwork, lots of training. And we'll continue to train because you need to keep the stuff sharp. Known as Surf City, USA, Huntington Beach was made famous by the 1963 song of the same name. Considered to have the most consistent surfing waves on the West Coast, Huntington Beach still lives up to its moniker. Here, large offshore sandbars help create epic surf for everyone to enjoy. Lifeguard Doug Leach has been patrolling this beach for over 12 years. Definitely keep everything iced because it's pretty swollen. Not too bad. Girls still like it. <laughs> like all lifeguards, Leach checked the weather before he came to work. Hot temperatures inland are making people flock to the beach. And with that said, we're having a lot of heavy west wind. So the water was a lot warmer a couple days ago. A few days ago, it was upwards of 70 degrees. Now we're looking around 60 degrees. That's all due to the heavy winds we've been getting. Doug is making a routine patrol when he receives an urgent call. Tower Zero advised that there's a very large rip current and uh, multiple people in the rip. Just considering- 41 that. from Zero, code two response, one swim in a rip, my lost is board. Uh, 41 copy. Now it's been upgraded to a code two call. Lifeguard Leo Polishek was scanning the waters in front of Tower 20 and noticed a man stuck at the end of a dangerous rip. This guy was just going up and down, bobbing, like raising his hand, like he was in trouble. Right then I just realized probably should just go. An inexperienced surfer stuck in a rip current can prove deadly. I just look and I see a head way out there in a rip current. Put my head down and then didn't even know whether I should put my head up 
to like slap a visual on him or put my head down to sprint. Mike Ingram was on the beach and witnessed the startling event unfold. The waves are probably 10 to 12 feet out there. Uh, and he was swimming straight through them. His arms are still going through the, the breaking waves. And he stopped maybe once just to triangulate because I think he lost the guy he was trying to get to. You have visual of the... Polishek reaches the victim. At the same time, Leach arrives to back up Tower 20. But the rip current is still building. Leach calls for PWC backup. That was a huge rip current. That was probably the biggest rip current I've ever been in. I mean, I thought the guy was going under. As Polishek strains to keep the victim afloat, the PWC races to the scene. So huge rip. Uh, guard made contact with the victim, and now the PWC is picking both of them up right in the middle of the rip. First, we thought there might have been a second victim, but just with the glare, it uh, turned out the second person was the guard. 41 from 20. Negative zero advised that the swimmer you have might be the one who lost the board. 41, affirmative. Uh, this, was, this was the victim I have to report. I'm going to take him in for tower 20. You all right, man? You didn't, uh, did you swallow any water at all? I'm fine, man, but that was crazy. Did you swallow any water? A little bit, but not a lot. All right, well, just to make sure, you might just come and have a seat up here, and uh, we'll, we'll just evaluate. Just want to listen to your lungs. Of course. Leo. Good work, man. Huh? Good work. I think it was a monster of a rip. He was just an inexperienced surfer that got in over his head, and if Leo weren't here, he easily could have drowned. Take a deep breath for me. We just wanted to go out and ride some whitewash, and I got sucked out, like, so fast. I was trying to stay calm, wait till it to, like, die down a little bit, but it was getting worse, you know what I mean? That rip when we pulled up, it was massive, man. I didn't even know anyone was coming to get me. And then I see this guy just coming, and it's like, it was, just, it was insane, for sure. It was insane. And I, I just kept saying sorry, how sorry I was, and they're like, dude, there's nothing he could have done. This is Huntington State Beach, located 50 miles south of Los Angeles. This popular stretch of sand extends for two miles. Pedro Hiron has spent two decades on this beach. He's witnessed almost everything, so he realizes that even a small problem can turn deadly. We're rolling medics, not a possible alert reaction for these things. Ten four out of that. I'm in route. Possible. Allergic reaction here at headquarters. The difference between a regular bee sting and somebody who's allergic to bees, it's critical. Their airway gets obstructed, they're having difficulty breathing. You know, they could they could die. Lifeguard Brian Stoudenbauer is already on scene. I was in headquarters. A lady came knocking on the door saying her son had been stung by a bee. This child had rashes and trouble breathing, so um, this was a pretty critical incident and he needed to get further medical attention. Lifeguard Enyo Roca was already in action. And we dispatched medics right away because knowing that he's already allergic to bee stings, it's, it's automatically, you gotta get the medics rolling. Yeah, breathing, 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 So we got him on high flow too. How's it going, buddy? Doing all right? Okay. Are you cold? When I first arrived, he was having difficulty swallowing. Uh, that's one of the signs of allergic reaction. You know, the, the throat starts to, uh, clothes on them. Where did you get stung at? I could clearly see that he was having a reaction by the rash that he was getting underneath his armpits, the neck area, the back. It became clearly that he was in, in distress. Do you want to lay down, buddy? You want to lay down? All right. He was panicking a little bit. He was concerned that he was having difficulty swallowing. So what happened? Tell me. Uh huh. And it stung you? Okay. How long ago did that happen? Like 20 minutes. 20 minutes ago? Yeah. A bee sting to normal people is, is just uncomfortable. But to someone who's allergic, who develops uh, an anaphylactic shock to, an, to a bee sting, it's life threatening. Daniel, do you know where you are right now? Yeah, at the beach. At the beach? Yeah. Cool. I did a lot of talking with him, mostly verbalizing to calm him down, but a lot of it to see um, the air exchange, to see if he's still able to talk to me, to communicate to me. And when I'm looking at him, I'm, I'm making sure that he's stable and he's not going into any type of shock. So if like zero is no pain and 10 is the worst pain you've ever had, what, what number would you give it? Okay. 
Mom. Like a nine? Really? Have you ever gone to the hospital before? For yeah, this? When I was a baby. When you were a baby, you went? OK. This is the third time he was stung. And every time he gets stung, it gets worse and worse as the reaction goes on. Paramedics arrive on scene and quickly evaluate the boy's symptoms and vital signs. Then they administer epinephrine. Epinephrine is adrenaline, and that's what you use for an allergic reaction. It actually allows the person to breathe easier because it relaxes the muscles, especially the respiratory area. Facility with an ETA of about uh, yeah. seven to eight minutes. We got some traffic on PCH here. If you know you have severe allergies, it's always good to have an EpiPen prescribed to you, so you know in case of emergency, you'll limit your risk of going into shock or having a more serious incident than you, you, than you should. Eighty miles to the south at Torrey Pine State Beach, visitors are experiencing near-perfect weather. California State Peace Officer Shane Scoggins is supervising lifeguards on the crowded beach. When we have super warm water like this, there isn't that much of a pressure change between what's happening on land and what's happening on the ocean, so the wind stays down, and that's why nobody's gone home yet. The area around Tower 5 is one of the most popular locations in Torrey Pines. It has ample parking and a wide river mouth that feeds warm water into the ocean. It's a magnet for little kids and the site of today's last call. 1417-1546, Legger. Dispatch to all units. We have a four-year-old missing child, south of Tower 5, last seen in the water. So a uh, four-year-old last seen by the sloop. So we'll go see if we can find him. We've got a description and go make contact with the parents. What was his name? Shimanj, S-H-I-B-A-N-S-H. Survive. Where's all your guys' stuff? The air. The, the red. Oh, no, no, no. The air next to the view. Is anyone else with you? Yeah, my husband and my another child. Where are they? My husband is looking for him and the what? another child is sitting there too. And I'm sure he went into the water. That's particularly sketchy for us because the tide was filling back in and people that have been crossing back and forth over that water have been doing fine until it just got flooded. So. We have a couple different ways to take the call. Is that your husband right there crossing the... Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Was he with anybody else, any other kids, or just by himself? I think he was alone. Alone? You last saw him in the water, right? Yeah, here. Okay, like right in here? My concern every time that there's a child last seen in the water is I want to trust that my guards didn't miss one. But it's always in the back of my mind, when do I need to start changing gears here and go from a land search to surface dives and, and going through the, the submersion protocols. And did, you didn't actually see him go down, right? No. So as of right now, we're going to treat this as a lost child. Okay. My job is to not outwardly be stressed out so that I don't pass that on to mom. It's important to give her the, a reason to have faith in us so that the more composed and, and calm that she is, the easier it's going to be for us to get the job done and find her child for it. With lifeguards scanning the beach for the missing boy, Peace Officer Shane Scoggins enlists the help of Torrey Pine State Park Ranger Kyle Knox. It's a four-year-old with blue shorts, Indian uh, juvenile. His last name by the slough in the water. I'd, I'd like someone to do the bathroom run first. Officer Scoggins now has a park ranger searching north of Tower 5 and lifeguards looking south of the river mouth. I can tell you that most of these lifeguards are watching the water, you know? I know he's a non-swimmer, I know you guys are concerned, but little guys tend to, to wander off. So don't get too worried yet, okay? We are looking for a four-year-old boy with a white shirt. All right. The search has continued for 40 minutes, and over 20 lifeguards have eyes on both land and water looking for the missing four-year-old. Dispatch to all units. Yeah. All attention all units on copper. 1297 is located, lost child. I made it approximately a quarter mile north. And you know, I was thinking, you know, I don't think the child made it this far. And I kept on going a little bit farther and someone flagged me down saying they saw a little boy. All the way up to that north boundary. I'll be back around Tower 5 area. One of our vehicles went up to the north boundary and they located him, so he's in the in the truck with them and then driving back now. Hello. He's all right. Thanks, hello. And yeah, so I'm happy for you. The boy has been found one mile north of his original location by park ranger Kyle Knox. All right, lucky guy. 
my boy life ka they are doing a really awesome job they they brought him back to me they brought him back to me back here just, just try a little stay a little closer to mom yeah, right i know just for few seconds you know we were just moving our stuff from that place to this place and they were just playing here in this this corner yeah a like few seconds but you look at it from their perspective like the whole beach from like this high it's just people it's really yeah. disorienting so normally when you show up to the beach like Hey, we're by Tower Five, and if yeah. you don't know where you are, go ask for Tower Five or go to the booth. And we'll, it's so much easier if the kid comes to us and then we can try to find you guys. But we're good. You guys enjoy the rest lot. of your day. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I'm just pumped it was that we found him on land and not in the water. Cause all I'm thinking is what's the next step. So I'm just kind of stressing out about worst case scenario. So it's a big relief for me, and then I'm just happy to see mom happy again.